I, I uh, hear some debates on YouTube, and I hear different places where I hear this expression, the God of the Old Testament. Hands up, have you ever heard that before? The God of the Old Testament. <laughs> As if there was a God of the Old Testament, and now there's a new God of the New Testament. It's kind of a funny thing to say, and it's a little bit of an urban myth, you could say, that we think of God divided in half. There's the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. It's kind of unfair to say that, but we, we sometimes imagine this God of the Old Testament with the finger, right? The wrath pouring out, the judgment, no mercy, no love, no anything, just a lot of punishment and law. And then when we think of the New Testament, well, that's when we think of sort of the nice loving God. Some people feel that. I hope that we don't feel that here, but I'm going to talk about that today. Um, it might be more accurate, instead of dividing God in half between like Old and New Testament, to say, well, there is maybe the God of the Bible versus the God of our culture. And uh, if you think about the God of sort of Western culture, you might imagine sort of the television evangelist, heal <laughs> your credit, or something like that. You might imagine the God of the sort of me society. God is all about you getting what you want, or God is all about you having the, having the kind of retirement plan that you want, or the kind of finances, or the kind of... That, that's a very God of Western civilization. So as we, maybe that's what we'll contrast more today. We'll contrast a little bit of God of the Old Testament, and we'll contrast God of Western thought. So, so let's look at that. We had uh, Jack read for us our scripture, and I'm going to get into that in a minute too. Um, in both these scenarios, we think of the God, God is love. But the real problem is how do we define that word love? Because that word is being redefined in our culture, isn't it? When we say what is loving, that means more and more and more things. And sometimes we think that we're in charge of that word love to define it for ourselves. But really, that word was passed down to us. That idea was given to us. And the creator who made us made that word love and made that idea and made that concept in our hearts. And when we're using the word to define God, sometimes we, we use it sort of as a describing word for him, where in fact, it's something that he's trying to teach us. That's going to open the way that I'm going to look at the law. We, we, we're reading about the law from the, the scripture that Jack has read here. And I want to look at that word love in a new way. Um, as we think about, well, sometimes people imagine sort of Jesus came on the scene when he was born. And then now we have a new aspect of God where he's really gentle and kind and compassionate and understanding. But Jesus has always been there. He said to, when he was asked... Um, well, what do you know sort of about, uh, about things back then? He says, well, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. He's saying I always existed. Jesus always has existed. He didn't just come into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. He existed before that. He came into existence as a man in Bethlehem, but he's always been there. He was there at creation. He was there in the character of God the whole time. I think we know this. I'm not saying this because this is brand new information. I'm saying it as a bit of a reminder that sometimes our brains kind of take this Western thinking and separate, you know, judgment and wrath and all these things versus, versus love. Now, um, when I was new in my faith, uh, I had a bit of a stint, a bit of a stint where I was legalistic. And uh, maybe some of you guys have had experience with that here too, or you know people close to you who've had experience with that. Um, when I say legalistic, let me define that. It means that we look at outward things as though that's the point. And a lot of religions do this, don't they? they? They talk about what you shouldn't eat, or they talk about what you shouldn't do, or what you shouldn't say, or what you should wear, how you should tuck in your shirt, or maybe you have to wear a head covering, or maybe you have to dress a certain color or have something, a veil over your face if you go out in public. There's a lot of procedure, a lot of ritual, a lot of religion. And these things, sometimes we do them in order to have an illusion of control. If we use religion as our control, let's say that we are gripping the steering wheel. 
here's what I felt. I felt when I was going through this, like, while I was having this legalistic phase, I felt like, well, the more that I do, the more God will bless me. Or the more that I am obeying these laws or obeying these rules, the more God will like me or the more he'll do what I want. And I know that sounds kind of like a crass thing to say, well, because why would God do our will? It isn't our will that should be followed anyway. God will do his own thing and there's no coercing him. Sometimes religions, you know, they're, they're offering up the, the sacrifice or they're doing this kind of thing to try and manipulate God. And God cannot be manipulated and he certainly doesn't want us to try. What, what these rules do is they can replace Jesus as the mediator. And when you get, you know, the Watchtower magazine, the, the people standing there, I've seen them around, they're telling you, hey, we know the truth about the Bible. Hey, we know the way to God. Hey, if you just follow our rules, if you just do our thing, we've got access. We know how to do this. We know how to get you what you want from God because we've got the ladder that goes straight there. We are the mediator. But we know there is only one mediator, and that mediator is Jesus. I say these things as a reminder, but I want to put this perspective behind the scripture that Jack has read. If we say to our, let's say we're married or something like that, let's say you said to him, I do everything you say, so how can you have a problem with me? Imagine a relationship, a marriage that was built just purely on rules, on laws, as in I do everything my wife says, how could she possibly have a trouble with me? Can you imagine if there was no love behind all the things that was going on? If there was no love in your heart at all, and you just did everything that person wants, it kind of holds a person hostage. It holds them in the hostage of your own righteousness. It says, well, I, I'm doing everything for you, and you're not doing anything for me. And why don't you love, you know, without love, it's one of the worst and meanest things you can do to be righteous to somebody. <laughs> it's, it's, you hold it as a weapon to them. Imagine we do that with God and you can have a little bit of the perspective that he's saying to these Pharisees who are doing exactly that for the outward show. They're obeying all these laws to make other people feel bad. They're making other, other people feel bad by, by being so righteous. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you actors. That's the Greek word for actors. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Let's do a little bit of uh, fill in the blanks here. I, I chose a very popular scripture. For by grace you have been saved. If you guys are jarring this down, I'll give you a second here. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the Gift, that's right. Gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's right. So that no one may boast. And you can just picture, maybe not with words, but with the kind of stature that these Pharisees would boast. You can just picture them going around saying to people, oh, you know, that nice fake smile, the nice condescending looks that sometimes happen today, too when we go to a place like Maple Pool, or to the soup kitchen, or we meet somebody on the street who has a tattoo, or we meet somebody who's smoking, the same looks can happen. They can say, well, I'm just going to be very righteous to you, because that's who I am, and you're not. But this last line here, that's pretty key, and it cuts right to the heart of what we do. It says, so that no one may boast, because if it truly is a gift, if the righteousness that we get from God is a gift, and it's not of ourselves, and it comes through faith, and it doesn't come from how much effort you put in or how much better you are than everybody else, then this whole comparison game, it gets dropped. Now, I think most of us know this, and I'm not saying this again because it's brand new. I'm saying it to put some context, like I said, behind what Jack has read here in the scriptures. Um, this existence of legalism that we say is the Old Testament God, and now in the New Covenant we don't have it anymore, that's, that's really a myth. There has always been legalism, there's always been religion that thinks they can manipulate God, and there's always been grace too. If we look at the Old Testament heroes, you know, Moses and David and Abraham, these are all men who didn't get to God because they were perfect. We know they, have, they were sinners. They were all men 
who didn't get to God because they did more than everybody else did. They got to God because of their relationship with him. They really spent time. They knew him. They trusted him. And they believed to the point where they would make their choices in their life, just like with my wife. I make choices in my life because of that relationship. And yes, they, they sinned. And yes, they had failures, maybe more sometimes than other people did. But their righteousness came like ours does as a gift. Galatians 3, 6 quotes Genesis 15, 6 here. It says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it. Credited. It was credited. It was a gift to him as righteousness. That same belief that we have, our same relationship, is what gets us to God. It's not the rules or the religion. Okay, you're probably getting tired of hearing this over and over, but I really wanted to make that point before we get into our scripture. Because the whitewashed tomb thing that Jesus brings up here, the whitewashed tomb of making a show on the outside, is what it amounts to when we as Christians do this. And we still do it sometimes today. A show of righteousness for others, but the inside isn't loving. And on the inside, if the inside doesn't match the outside, then he says it's like there's rotting bones in those tombs. And yeah, they might be painted nicely on the outside, but what is the point? Jesus now says in our scripture that Jack read that not one jot or tittle would pass away. That's, that's the same as saying one apostrophe or one comma. Not one comma or apostrophe is going to disappear from the law until all is accomplished or all is fulfilled. And when we think of that, it really challenges those who say, oh yeah, yeah, the law is all forgotten. That was the old days. Now we live in a new age of grace and you can forget all about the law. The law was for that time and it's all... It's all done. Now we have Jesus and we can forget everything. But what Jesus does, he was asked this question. They asked him, so did you come to abolish the law? Is that why you're doing some very different things that we didn't expect? And he said, no, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. I came to show what the law was for. And here's the key to it. If you think of the law, we talked about it, our small group is a bone structure. This is an analogy from a doctor who worked with, uh, uh, with leprosy patients who was a deep Christian. He studied the bones of the body, said, those bones provide freedom. If they're not rigid, if they don't move the right way, you can't move at all. And the spasms that you have in your body when things go wrong, the broken bones that inhibit movement, they show you the purpose of the laws, those rigid things that guide for freedom. And we know that they were put there for love too. The same love that I have for Lexi that puts guidelines around what we do around the stove, the electrical sockets, that same love fulfills the law. And Jesus said, I want to show you what the law is really about. It's not just if you kill somebody, it's about what's in your heart. It's about the hatred that can be in your heart. And he also said, nothing here is going to pass away till all is accomplished. Now, isn't it interesting that his hearers didn't really realize that all was going to be accomplished in just a few years? They didn't have to wait centuries and thousands of years for Jesus to come back because he was going to accomplish everything, absolutely everything in the cross. Now that is a key for understanding the scripture. When, we, when I remember talking to some of my fellow youth pastors years ago about this verse and thinking, well, what's the deal? He, on the one hand, he says, you know, nothing is passing away from the law. And then the other, we read about this, this very, very overt verse about the free gift of grace. So how do these fit together? And I remember this youth pastor saying, but look at that word accomplished, fulfilled. That's exactly what Jesus has done in his sacrifice. So that this puts these two ideas together. But what it doesn't do is just say goodbye to the law to say, oh yeah, the law was a useless thing that we had back then. What it says is it fulfills the law and shows us what the law is for. And it shows us a righteousness, which is through faith, which it always has been. And it puts it into our hearts. When he was asked, what's the greatest law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. We read this morning, love is patient and it doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It isn't proud. It honors others and doesn't seek its own way. When we're defining love with our own culture, sometimes the love that we think of, the love from the love songs, the pop songs on the radio, what kind of love is that? 
Does it do some of these things? Sometimes we just interchange love and the idea we might have from our culture with this love that we read in 1 Corinthians that doesn't lose its temper, that forgives and doesn't keep a record of wrongs, that shares the truth, that protects, that always trusts, that always hopes, that always perseveres. And it isn't a robotic kind of thing. Sometimes in our marriages it can become robotic and that's when things kind of break down, when the love is just replaced by rules or when instead of talking in relationship and working things out, all we're left with is just a bunch of law. It isn't robotic. It's, it's, it's involving us. There is nothing harder than love. See, I think what the hippie generation did for our thinking is they made us think that love was way easier. Love is just a super easy thing. It's nice and fluffy. We can all just love each other. It's really great. We'll have love ends. We'll all just spread the love. It'll be a great, happy place. And I think what they missed from that generation, and some of you guys are from that generation here, and you'll understand it better than I do, but I think what was missed is that love is usually the harder thing. Love is usually the harder choice because you have to, have to persevere. You have to make the hard choice to keep your heart in it, to keep trying. The hard choice to forgive, the hard choice to really seek what that other person wants. Not just the actions, but what's really in their heart. And love doesn't get this kind of spoiling thing where we just let people do what we want. If I let Lexi do whatever I want, I'm not loving her. And the, and the, the same one who gives, oh, have another pop, have another Sunday. Have I know some of your grandparents spoil your grandkids, and that's fine. They, that's, that's a great way to show some love. But love that just spoils that has no rule, that has no law to it, that really isn't love either. And maybe what I'm trying to blow up today is this false thing of love in our society. Did anybody ever see way back in the day the, the, the Love Song movie? Or I think that's what it's called. It, it, love Story, thank you, yeah. It's love means never having to say you're sorry. Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. If you're married, there are so many stories and there's so much forgiveness needed. And love is about really getting through things. It's not about not saying you're sorry. And I, I love this picture from um, another kind of hippie picture from the 70s. 73 came out with this one. Uh, I don't know if you've got the sound up for it, do you? Here we have uh, white man's afro on Jesus. This is Jesus playing in God's spell. And uh, yeah, we have a hippie kind of Jesus who's just... <laughs> Anybody see this movie before? God's spell? Yeah, okay, it might bring back some memories. You know, they're going to go around the neighborhood. They're just going to fix things up and dance and have a great time. I remember a guy in my, my high school talking about love as the solution. It was kind of like this. We're just going to love each other and that's going to be so easy. I really am not at all advocating this as a picture of love though. This kind of hippie, fluffy, oh it's easy, we'll just all love and paint our faces and be happy together. Peace, peace, peace. The problem is, is that Jesus right there couldn't win a fight. He's as scrawny as I am. <laughs> he's not able to win a fight. And he's too sissy to do anything about what's going on in the world. And he might be able to get a couple of people to, you know, well, let's go around and paint the neighborhood. But the problem is, is that he's not the only one around. Jesus isn't the only one in this neighborhood. And unfortunately, what the great deceiver's greatest accomplishment is, is that most people believe that these days. Most people believe there is a God. But if you ask them, is there a Satan? They will say, oh, no, I don't think there's a Satan. I don't see any evidence of that kind of thing. The great deceiver, his greatest deception, is that so many people don't even believe in him. And he is on the block, too. He's in this world, too. He's doing a lot of stuff. And if all we believe in is this sissy Jesus, who's got a white man's afro, who's going around, hey, peace, peace, peace. He can't stand up to that guy. He can't stand up to the bully. He can't do anything about it. And we want somebody to do something about the bully who's in the neighborhood. The bully who's out there to destroy us. Um, I've been reading C.S. Lewis aloud with my wife and my, my little two-year-old. 
And uh, we just read The Silver Chair. Has anybody read The Silver Chair before? Okay, there's a scene in The Silver Chair, which I love. And uh, you have a prince who's been captured and enchanted by this beautiful witch. And the witch has this power over him where he's just sort of this docile, happy, la, la, la guy and doesn't do anything. And she's going to use him as a puppet king to take over. But once a day, at a certain hour, he comes out of his enchantment. She has convinced him to sit down in this silver chair and to be strapped up. So when he has his fits of insanity, he won't hurt anybody. If you remember the story, you're like, oh yeah, that's right, I remember that part. That's what I kind of remembered before I reread it. So they strap him up in, in, this, in this silver chair, and then he's like, oh, I'm myself again. I, oh, this is the witch, this is the witch, this is the one who enslaved me. And he sees all the truth for about an hour, and he raves, and he's just trying to fight his way out of this chair. And then it goes away, and he's back into the enchantment. Okay, well, from our world, a couple of little kids in the story are sent to go and save him. And they find him, but they don't recognize him because he doesn't look like a prince at all. He looks like this docile, sort of enchanted weirdo. And they're talking to him, and they're thinking, oh, this is kind of weird. And he warns them. He's like, hey, you know what? You're going to have to go into a different room. Uh, the, the, she, he calls her his sort of beloved, beautiful, um, enchanted, whatever. She's gone away for a while. But, hey, why don't you guys go away too? Because I'm going to have this fit of insanity. And, I, and apparently I say all kinds of awful things there, and I might hurt you. So why don't you go away? I don't want you to be there while they strap me to the chair, because this happens to me every, every day. So he warns them to, to leave him, basically. But they come back because he's screaming to them. He's saying, hey, save me, save me, come in, save me. Now I'm in my proper mind. And they come back in, and sure enough, he's come out of his enchantment. He hasn't gone into a fit of insanity. He's come out of his enchantment, and he's asking and begging to be saved. So they listen to him, and then they realize this is the prince they've been trying to save the whole time. So they, they untie his straps and stuff like that. And he reaches and he grabs his sword and he chops apart the silver chair. He's like, finally, that enchanted thing is done. I can't be put into that chair anymore. And then he comes to a sense. He's like, okay, now is our hour to escape. The witch is gone for a little bit. She hardly ever leaves. Now is our hour to escape. Let's get out of here. Let's get out. I'm finally free. Just then, the witch comes back. And she's beautiful. And they all see her, and they're surprised at her beauty. And she goes, she tosses a little bit of dust, some fairy dust or whatever it is, into the fire. And then this aroma fills the room. And it's kind of just puts everybody to sleep. And she gets her ukulele out, and she starts singing. I could just picture her like, love, 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 you know. Just something really enchanting, and I, I don't have anything against the Beatles, don't worry. But I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, she's singing this little tune and they all sort of go back to sleep and they're like, oh, and she starts talking to them. Oh, did you have your fit of rage again? Oh, well, it's okay now. You know, I'm back. You're over it. It's okay. Here, it's, everything's going to be fine. And they all get back into her enchanted mess again from this wicked witch, except one of them, who, uh, his name is Puddleglum. He goes and he sees what's going on. He sees what was thrown into the fire. So he goes to the fire and he stomps it out with his bare foot. And suddenly, in place of this smell of the enchanting potion that's in the room, you have the smell of burning flesh. And they're all like, because <coughs> he burned his foot on this thing. And all the smoke is filling the room because he put the fire out. And they're all like choking. And they're like, oh. And they come to their senses, like smelling salts. And they're like, oh, well, that's the wicked witch. How did she do that to us? That's the witch that we just tried to free this guy from. And, and the prince comes to his senses too. He grabs his sword and he's like, hey. Then she changes back, like you see here in this picture, into her true form, which is a huge serpent, to devour them all. And at this point, he, he fights and stabs the serpent and, 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 and overcomes this wicked witch. I love that picture because so often we come out of our stupor only to go back into another stupor. And we're in a world which has a great deceiver, a very, very great deceiver, who is offering us intelligence and reasonability and this and that. And he's offering us so many different, wonderful, happy things and love. And we don't want to see a God 
We don't want to see a God who is violent. We don't want to see a God who can wield a weapon. We want to accuse the God of the Old Testament is too violent. We need the police to be able to have guns, to stand up against the bullies. We need to have someone who can wield the sword. And if all we relegate Jesus to is this loving hippie, and we're saying, oh, well, I don't know if God really should be that violent, or I don't know if God really could stand up with that kind of authority, that doesn't seem good to me. Then what is happening in our hearts is we're listening to the great deceiver, and we're not seeing that we need a God who could protect us. Love protects. It's trying to protect us from the one who wants to torture us and destroy us, who sends us to destruction through these enchantments and lies. And sometimes here in, in North America, it's true that we have no need for protection. Oh, I'm fine. No, no, I don't need God. I've, I've got my insurance. I'm, I'm all settled. We've got great health care. We're fine. We don't have any need for any kind of protection. I, I'm, I'm protecting myself. Thank you very much. I'm fine. We don't think the Ebola virus is going through Africa could touch us. We don't think that any of these things could happen here. We're fine. We've got our, our finances. We've got our different things to protect us, our police. Everything's taken care of. And we miss the one who's coming to save us and saying, hey, I'm coming to rescue you because we're like that silly king or the silly prince who's been enchanted. We've been enchanted by all that's going around and it whispers in our ears, hey, did God really say? Did God really say? Well, is that really loving? Oh, that doesn't sound loving to me. A God who did that, who opened up the earth and swallowed people into it, that doesn't sound like a loving God. A God who would put people to death, that doesn't sound loving. How could you say he's loving? Maybe he's just like you are. Maybe he's selfish. Maybe he's just mad. Maybe he's angry, but it doesn't sound loving to me. And you're accusing these other people of not being loving? Oh, how could you come in judgment over them? That's a very loving thing. How can you say that this isn't loving? Doesn't it feel loving to you? All the while, these lies are coming in. Did God really say? Did God really say this? And they're twisting and turning our ears and tainting our view of God. And then you can stomp out the fire. You could, you could be like Puddle Glum there when you open the scripture. And you allow the smelling salts of the truth of the word of God to just cut through all these lies and deceit and this charm that's coming through like smoke in the fire. We read, no, 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 God isn't the bad guy. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, it says, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. In him is nothing but goodness. He doesn't change. He's not an Old Testament and New Testament God. He doesn't change like shifting sh shadows. That wakes us up out of these stupors that the culture is saying. When, when we say, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me, he says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you, God says. His deep love went to the cross. It went and was, there was no, no expense that was spared for us. There was no pain. There was no sacrifice. There was no, nothing that he would put aside so that we could be with him. And we have such a tainted and distorted view of law and righteousness and goodness in God here. We have lawlessness. We have a culture that embraces lawlessness, unless if it's not working for us. We have a God who isn't very just or fair. Well, is God very fair? How could he be fair? It doesn't seem very fair to me. We have a twisted, twisted culture tainted by the great deceiver. And Jesus is asking us to come out of that culture. He says, hey, it, it'll probably hate you. The culture around you will probably hate you because it hated me. But come to me. I want to make you fruitful. I want you to connect to me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And when you connect to me, there's going to be really good results from that. Goodness and fruit. And it's going to be good to eat and it's going to be good to give. We're going to give love to those who need it. We are going to make a change where a change is needed. And the best way that I could look at the law 
is in my own marriage. I, I am privileged to have a happy marriage. And uh, I'm not going to say knock on wood because love isn't some coincidence like this culture says. Oh, somehow they fell out of love and now they're getting a divorce. Love isn't some kind of coincidence that you just sort of happen to fall into by fate and then happen to fall out of. But it's a lot of work. I choose love. I choose to put love into my marriage. I choose to make choices of love in my marriage. And that law that maybe we're scared of sometimes is at the root of our marriage too. We don't cheat. I don't cheat on my wife. And I don't want her to lie to me. And I don't want to lie to her. And it's those very, that very law which is at the heart of our love too. The two are completely intertwined. And that's what Jesus is saying. The righteousness, the law, the goodness of God, his order is intertwined with his love. They work together here. And he wants us to have righteousness much more than the Pharisees who have it all on the outside, this veneer, this, this veneer of being better and boasting and, and putting other people down while inside there's rot. He wants us to have a true fruit from him that grows as we're connected, that when we're connected to Jesus, fruit comes. That's what he wants, that kind of goodness. A gift. Fruit comes as a gift. It's put there as a gift. Loving God means keeping his commandments, John says. And his commandments aren't burdensome. In my marriage, I don't have to think, oh, it's such a burden to not cheat on my wife. Or it's such a burden to not lie to her. I think, oh no, that's not a burden. I love her. I want to preserve this. This is a good thing. And that's what John said. I love God so much. Hey, his commandments are not burdensome. Keep his commandments and you're showing you love him. Keep my trueness to my wife. You're showing your love for God. Now we have a little better view. Now that the veil is torn in the new covenant, we have an advantage. A little better view about who God is. For, for so many centuries, people had imagined God was maybe tyrannical or maybe erratic or they didn't really understand what was going on. So he came to show us who he really was in Jesus. And when that happened, it, the, the veil was torn so that we could come closer to God. We could know God more. Imagine how Job felt. He couldn't see anything that was going on. He, he thought probably God was the one giving him the boils. He thought probably God was the one who had killed his family. And we know that it wasn't. We can see the background of that story. We could see that it was Satan doing these things. But he didn't know that. And he couldn't see much of what was going on. And all he had around him was bad advice. He had people who were pointing the finger and saying, hey... You're the problem here. If you just be nice to God, you'd get what you wanted. They were saying, hey, step up your religion, Job. You're not being religious enough. If you just do some more things, God will give you what you want. But you're obviously doing something wrong. Why don't you turn around and stop doing that? So he had nothing but bad advice, and he was blinded. But now it's like the Holy Spirit takes the blinders off, and we can see who God really is. And we can also see their great deceiver, too. That's what the Holy Spirit allows us to see. Pray for that. Pray for that insight to be able to see what's behind, what's behind the scenes of these simple conflicts that we have with people, of the simple difficulties in forgiveness, of the simple things that are happening day by day in your fights. Let's open our eyes. This isn't just us. We don't just war against flesh and blood, against other people. There's angels and powers and principalities that are trying to shut this church down, that are trying to hurt us, that are trying to prevent us from being effective, to prevent us from being fruitful, to prevent us from building, to prevent us from being an outreach, a light to this neighborhood that would step on us and try and hurt us and do it so subtly like that witch with her enchanting smoke. Now we can see better. And I like the vision of Narnian's king, this lion. This isn't a king who's tame or nice necessarily, sometimes wild and fierce. Sometimes he appears to be cruel because we don't understand what's going on. But there's goodness that can't be argued and a righteousness that can't be argued. And beyond all those things, a love that defines him, that comes to us. This is the same God, the same love. Throughout all time in the Old Testament, Jesus is there. This Aslan character that we have pictured here, here to love us and to show us his character and to show us that he is good and that he wants to show us his law is good. And his love is good. And he wants to show us how to give that to each other. How can, I, how can I increase this in you? How can I increase the fruit? I'm going to, uh, to pray now. So let's, let's uh, bow our heads and let's, uh, let's close in prayer. A prayer asking for, for God to help us see. Dear God, help us to, um, to see past the day-to-day 
the conflicts. I know I've had mine this week, and uh, I know others probably have here too. Help us to see past what's, what's just here in the visible, uh, uh, to see out of the blindness that Job experienced, and to see what's really going on. Help us to see through your Holy Spirit what's really happening, and the hope that you bring, and that you have power beyond what we could possibly imagine, that you have love that can work through us and transform us, that you're, you're trying to gift to us a fruit that we can share. Help us to share that fruit with, uh, with our friends, our neighbors. Thank you for my neighbors, Andy and Molly. We pray that they'll know that fruit. They'll know your goodness, and they'll get out of the deception of the great deceiver. I know there's other neighbors here too, and we pray for them. Those, those conversations, the way that they see us, that we're not a veneer, we're not a hypocrite, we're not a Pharisee, but that they see our love for others. They see our love for them, and they see that you're love. We pray that that'll, that'll pass on through us, God. And uh, yeah, we pray for energy. We know uh, some of us are tired, and there's a birthday this afternoon for Lexi, and there's, there's other things going on, visitors coming, there's people to see and things to do, and sometimes we feel tired. So we ask for your energy, God, to fill us up and, and give your joy, because there's so much in your, your victory to celebrate, God, and in your love. Amen.